Well, aloha everyone and welcome back to Biology 101 here at Chaminade University. Today we'll be covering Unit 12, which involves the mechanisms of evolution. We will be talking about the interrelatedness of populations, genes, and evolution. We will be talking about evolutionary forces and mechanisms of evolutionary change. And then we will talk about selective pressure from your environment and how that natural selective pressure works on populations. Now, when we talk about evolutionary theory, we're talking about a change that's very subtle from one generation to the next, but accumulates over multiple generations. So although the subtle differences from parents to offspring might not be as obvious, there will be many differences between the far generations, the ancestral generations, and their descendants. Now, before we go much further, I want to discuss a very clear distinction here, that evolution is not something that an individual can do. An individual cannot evolve something new, right? And population as a whole is able to evolve simply because there is variability within the population and there are individuals within that population that are able to rise and meet whatever the environmental challenge is, which leads to changes in the phenotype or the expression of, or the percentage of the expression of certain alleles in the population over time. So again, evolution is a property of a population not a, an individual. And a population is a group of all members of a particular species that live in a given area and are therefore able to interbreed. Um, all right, so I also want to state that the actions of the individuals and the fates of the individuals all determine what gets passed on to the descendants. So what that means is that all of the inheritance patterns that that individual has, has is going to play a role in the ability of that individual to survive and reproduce. And individuals with the increased survival and reproduction, right, increase what we call reproductive success, are going to pass their genes on to the next generation at a higher frequency. Um, and that's called inheritance, right? Inheritance is when you're passing genes on from one generation to the next. And inheritance is going to provide the link between the lives of individual organisms and the evolution of populations. So again, when we're talking about evolution, we're talking about evolution on a larger scale, on an entire population, not on an individual. Okay, so if you remember our genetics lectures, then you'll understand some of these words, but I'm going to define them for you as though you're just showing up to class. Um, so if you are looking at a location in the genome, you are looking at a locus, right? You have two copies of each chromosome, and that means you have two copies of each locus, right? And at those, that particular region, those loci, you can have either the exact same allele or two different types of alleles. So for example, for eye color, you could have two for blue eyes, which would mean that you were homozygous for that gene, or you could have one blue eye gene and one brown eye gene, and that would make you heterozygous for that gene. Okay, and inside every cell, you have information that's encoded in the form of DNA, right? And DNA is what's found inside the chromosomes that are condensed into these specific chromosomes. And regions, of those chromosomes that code for an entire sequence. So basically a gene is a region that codes for one RNA molecule, which then codes for one protein molecule. That's found at a specific locus or location on that chromosome. And again, you can have different nucleotide sequences there that allow you for different variability. And if you have the exact same one, the same allele, for example, you would be called homozygous at that location. If you have two different alleles, then you would be called heterozygous at that location. And the way that these alleles interact with each other and with their environments influences the physical traits of the organisms. And that, in turn, influences the behavioral traits of the organisms. And those two together, the physical and behavioral traits, are known as the phenotype. So the allele combinations themselves are known as the genotype, and the physical and behavioral traits are known as the phenotype. Okay, so a good example of this to illustrate the interaction between genotype and phenotype is the example of coat color in hamsters. So in hamsters, coat color is determined by two alleles. One allele is dominant, and that dominant allele catalyzes black pigment, and that's going to be denoted as a capital P, uh, sorry, capital B going forward. Uh, the recessive allele encodes for brown pigment, and that's going to be denoted as a lowercase b going forward. So hamsters that have one dominant allele, that is, they are either homozygous dominant, meaning that they have two capital Bs, or they are heterozygous, meaning that they have one of each, one capital M, one lowercase b, um, they're going to produce black pigment, because you only need one copy of a dominant allele to produce a phenotype. 
Now, in order to have the recessive phenotype, you'd have to have a homozy homozygous recessive individual, meaning that you have two recessive alleles, and that means that you're going to produce brown pigments. All right, so what does that look like? So you note here that this one here on the left and this one in the middle both have the same phenotype. Phenotype meaning outward appearance of the organism. This one, on the other hand, has a different phenotype. Why? Because it's brown instead of black. But if you look at the genotypes, the genotypes are the actual combination of the alleles. In this case, it's homozygous dominant, two copies of the black allele, right? Note that they're at the exact same locus on the chromosome. And they're essentially the same, they pair the same, they just happen to be a mutated version of one another. And if you were heterozygote, that means you have two separate copies. In this case, you would have an uppercase B and a lowercase B, and that would still give you the black or dominant phenotype, but you would have a heterozygote genotype. And if you were homozygous, you have two lowercase Bs, you have the lowercase B, lowercase B genotype, meaning that you have a phenotype of the brown hamster. Okay. All right, so all of the alleles in the gene pool, all of the alleles in the population are called the gene pool. Um, and that means that the gene pool is going to consist of double the amount of alleles as the number of individuals in a population. Remember, we each have two alleles for each of our, um, each of our genes. So if we're looking at population genetics, we're looking at the inheritance of the alleles. So we're looking at the allelic frequency. But there are a couple of ways that this can actually change. So you can have the same allelic frequency but have a different distribution of the alleles that gives you a different phenotypic frequency. So we're looking at multiple different things here. Um, but when we boil it down to a gene pool, we're talking about all of the alleles of the genes of all of the individuals in the population. Again, that means that we are going to have twice the amount of genes then we do individuals. So it's going to be twice the number of individuals could carry because each of the individuals carry two copies. All right, so for any given gene, the proportion of times that that allele occurs in that population is called its allelic frequency. And all of these allelic frequencies are going to add up to 100, 100% um, 100 or 1.0. Now again, if we're looking at coat color and hamsters, we have two separate alleles. So this is a very simplified version. Sometimes we can have three alleles or more, but an individual, of course, can only carry two. But in a population, we can have multiple different sets. Think of all the different types of hair color, for example. Um, now, if a population of hamsters is 25 individuals, that means we're going to have 50 alleles of the coat color, right? That means we have two copies of each. Now, if 20 out of those 50 code for black, then the frequency of the black allele is 0.4 or 40%, and you get that by dividing 20 by 50. All right, and here this just kind of shows you how that breaks down. So here you have a population of 25 individuals. These individuals here, one, two, three, and four, are our homozygous dominant individuals. Um, that means that they are going to have two copies of the homozygous, uh, of, sorry, of the dominant gene. So here we have four individuals. That means we have eight of the, um, of the dominant allele. Here we have heterozygotes. We have a total of 4 times 3 is 12, right? And they are each going to have one of each. So that means that we're going to have 12 copies of the dominant and 12 um, alleles of the recessive. And then here if we look at the recessive individuals, right? These are going to be the homozygous recessive individuals. That means they're contributing two copies of that recessive allele. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That means that we are contributing 18 copies of our recessive allele. That's going to give us a total of 20 copies of the um, dominant and 30 copies of the recessive allele in the gene pool. Now note that even though it looks like we have um, 30 copies of allele B, that means that you would assume that we actually are going to have more of that phenotype, but that's not the case, right? Because we only need one copy of the dominant allele in order to have the dominant phenotype. So we actually the majority of the individuals are going to display the dominant phenotype, even though it's not the majority of alleles in the gene pool, all right? So keep in mind that we might be talking about different types of percentages, so pay attention to what we're asking for if you see a question like that on the exam. Now again, evolution is talking about a population, and it's the change in allelic frequencies from one generation to the next. And so when we think about evolution, right, we think about a, a changes of outward appearance or changes of behaviors of a members of a population, right? However, as a population geneticist, we are strictly talking about allelic frequencies, so the change in allelic frequencies that occur in any given population over a particular set period of time. Now, if that allelic frequencies 
change from one generation to the next, then the population is evolving. And if those allelic frequencies do not change, then the population is said to be equilibrium. So again, evolution is the change in the genetic makeup of populations over multiple generations. So what do I mean when I say equilibrium? So an equilibrium population is a population that's generally a hypothetical because most populations are under some sort of selective pressure or another. But in order for evolution to not occur, in order for a population to maintain in what we call Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and that's called that because um, there was a mathematician named Hardy and a physician named Weinberg that came up with this theory together. It's called the Hardy-Weinberg principle, and it's a mathematical model that they use to talk about population genetics to decide whether or not a population is undergoing selective pressure, i.e., is it evolving or not. So the Hardy-Weinberg principle is used to demonstrate a population where allelic and genotypic frequencies remain constant from one generation to the next generation to the next. And again, this is an idealized population where we have no changes in allelic frequency from generation 1 to generation 10, right? So for multiple generations. And in order for that to occur, we have five parameters that have to be hit. And if any one of these parameters is not met, then the population is sub subjective or able to be subjected to selective pressure. So again, these five parameters for an equilibrium population, first, there must be no mutations. As soon as you introduce a new allele because of a mutation event, you automatically change the percentages, right? Even if you were at exact 25, 25, 25, 25, well, now that you've added a fifth allele to the population, no matter what, even if it's only 1%, it's going to change the rest of the numbers. So if we have a new allele that arises, that's considered a mutation, that's automatically going to change our um, percentages of allelic frequencies in the next generation. Additionally, there can be no gene flow, right? No genes coming in, no genes coming out. So it must maintain a population where we have no immigration and no emigration. Right, emigration meaning to leave. Also, the population must be very large. I'm not sure if you know anything about statistics, but the larger your sample set, the better the chances are that your statistics are accurate, right? So the smaller that your population is, the more susceptible it is to small changes that might end up throwing it out of balance. So you want to make sure that you have a very large population so that small things like an individual um, getting hit by a bus, for example, isn't going to eliminate one-tenth of the genes in the population. It's going to eliminate one one-millionth of the genes in the population. So it's going to have a very small influence. So again, you have to have a very large population in order for the elimination of any one individual to be a very small event. Additionally, mating has to be random. If we have any sort of mate selection, and we're selecting four specific genotypes, etc., that means that that person's going to have an increased reproductive success, and reproductive success is exactly how we define their ability of these you know, populations to evolve. Right? So mating has to be random with no tendency for populations to be directed by mate choice or mate selection, and there can be no natural selection, right? No predation, no environmental pressure, no differences between one part of the population and the other. Now again, all five of these seem like they, in order for them to be very tightly regulated, seems to be a slim impossibility. This is an ideal population in which we are maintaining equilibrium. Now we're going to talk about the flip side of the coin, which is going to talk about how we can cause a population to undergo evolution. Or, realistically, what are the mechanisms of evolution? And so we can flip the same question and say, what are the five mechanisms of evolution? And they are the exact opposite of those Hardy-Weinberg conditions. Remember, few natural populations are ever going to be truly in equilibrium. And a violation of any one of those five, or more, could cause a change in allelic frequencies, which will allow the population to evolve. So, again, using those same five principles of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and we take the flip side of the coin, we have, very predictably, five major causes of evolutionary change. The first is mutation. Again, as soon as we get a new allele introduced in the population, our numbers there, our numbers previously were 50-50, now they're automatically 50-49-1, right? So something has to give that changes the numbers entirely when we add a new allele to the population. Secondarily, gene flow. If we have new genes introduced, that actually could change the amount of genes in the population by adding a new allele, or it can just change, per se, population A is 50-40, or sorry, population A is 51-49, and population B is 70-30. Now, if population B floods in, now we're going to have a change in the allelic frequencies just by 
matter of dispersal, right, in population A. So gene flow has to, is one major cause of evolutionary change. Additionally, we can have small population sizes. If we get down to a small population size, the death of one individual can drastically change the percentages of the alleles in the population. And non-random non mating is one of the major causes of selective pressure, right? Mate selection means that we can select for taller and taller and taller individuals over time, smarter and smarter individuals over time, stronger and stronger individuals over time, or something like the toucan, right? A larger and a larger beak, or something more flamboyant, like the feathers on a peacock over and over, right? So mate selection actually is highly influential in terms of phenotypic change or uh, evolutionary change over time. Um, and then natural selection, which would be any sort of selective pressure from the environment, which causes one individual to have better chances of reproductive success over another individual. All right, so let's talk about each of these individually. Let's talk about mutations. If a population is to maintain evolutionary equilibrium, there can be no mutations. Right? Um, and inherited mutations are actually very important because that's how we get all of the different alleles that have ever come to be. Um, and the cumulative effect of all of these mutations is essential to the evolution of one species into another species. So it's very important for speciation for these mutations because these mutations add up from one generation to the next. Um, now mutations are not goal-directed. Students tend to get the idea that there's some sort of intention behind these, but mutations are just spontaneous. They arise kind of off the cuff, and oftentimes they are deleterious or negative for the individual, and oftentimes that means that, that it would be an end of the line mutation. Every once in a while, however, something comes along that happens to be beneficial in that specific selective environment. And again, it's not as a result or an anticipation of environmental necessity, it just happens to fit the environment and therefore becomes more prevalent in the next generation. Okay, so here's a velvet stamp technique that's used to transfer bacterial colonies. So if we're starting here, this is a, just to demonstrate that evolution can occur, right? Um, if we're starting here with bacterial colonies that have never been exposed to antibiotics and we stamp them on multiple different dishes, and in each of those dishes we add an antibiotic streptomycin, you can see that even though all of these colonies appeared to be the same, there were subtle differences in the population. And what do I mean by that? I mean that after they're introduced to an antibiotic, only four of the colonies remain. And you'll notice the same four colonies in all three of the dishes, indicating that it was the same starter colony in this bacterial plate that already had the resistance to it to begin with. Okay, it's not as though these bacteria see the streptomycin and then decide they want to be able to overcome the challenge. No, the ones that are unable to overcome the challenge die off. And the ones that are able to overcome the challenge, well, now they have free reign of the Petri dish. So with very few generations, all of the colonies are going to be resistant to streptomycin because any individuals that aren't are going to be killed off. All right, so let's talk about gene flow. It's another mechanism of evolution of populations. And basically what happens is alleles come from one population to another, and if we don't have the exact same concentration or allelic frequency is what I should say, actually, allelic frequencies in population A and population B, then we can cause a change in the populations as these genes are allowed to flow from one population to another. Um, however, when I say this, you kind of think of like people walking from one city to another. But keep in mind, sometimes alleles are able to move from populations from one to population to another, even if the organisms themselves do not. And a good example of this is pollen, um, which is a way of dispersing the sperm and also seed dispersal from flower and plants. And they're able to move and distribute the alleles kind of all over, much further away than the individual plant which originally created them ever traveled. And the evolutionary effect of this genetic flow is to increase the similarity of different populations of a species from a genetic standpoint. And if we mix these alleles, that's going to allow us to prevent the development of large differences in the composition of different populations. And that means that these populations are going to be able to remain interbreeding. However, if something is blocked between population A and population B, so for example, um, a giant canyon or a huge forest or a desert or something like that that blocks two populations, the genetic differences between population A and population B that occur over time based on different selective pressure in these different areas can become so large that speciation occurs. And what do I mean by that? That means that one of the populations becomes an entirely new species, meaning that population A and population B can no longer interbreed.
Okay, so when we talked about population evolution, we also talked about the size of the population being important. And that's because we are always going to have a certain percentage of bad luck, right? Call it the step out in front of a bus clause. Or in terms of a plant, for example, if a plant's seed ends up on concrete, which is never watered and has no dirt, that seed has no chance no matter how strong its genetics are. So there's a small bad luck clause that's going to prevent certain members from the population from reproducing. And if we're just randomly removing alleles from the gene pool, we want to make sure that they don't have a huge influence on the overall genetic population of, or genetic composition of the population. A large population allows us to do that because that means that the loss of one individual isn't felt as greatly. So, for example, if we had a population of 1,000, losing one individual is not as big of a deal as losing one individual out of a population of 10. So we can change the allelic frequencies by chance events, and we want to make sure that we have a reduction in the impact of these chance events as much as we possibly can. Again, some examples of bad luck, the getting hit by a bus clause that I just talked about, um, would be seeds that fall in the parking lot or into a pond, um, flowers that are burned before they're able to pollinate, or any organism that's killed by, say, a flood or a drought prior to reproductive age. All right, we also talked about genetic drift. Genetic drift basically is when chance events change your allelic frequencies. And again, this doesn't really have as big of a hold on large populations, but on small populations, a small random chance event can dramatically change the allelic frequencies. Right, a small random chance event can dictate that alleles from only a few individuals are passed on. And in small populations, drift can result in only a few generations, even if it's the more frequent one, just based on random chance events. So as we talked previously about hamster coat color, right? Here are the first generation that we talked, actually this isn't even the generation we talked about. Here we're talking about 50-50. So we have the frequency of the dominant and the recessive alleles are 50-50. And if we had destruction of almost all of the individuals except this individual and that individual in the population were allowed to survive and rebreed to create generation two, and from this Punnett square, our combination of allelic frequencies should be approximately 25 and 75 percent for the dominant and the recessive phenotype. And then if again we had a random chance event that picked two and we happened to pick these two, now we have entirely eliminated. We are down to 100 percent of the recessive allele and zero percent of the dominant allele in just two generations time. So genetic drift has changed the coat color from dark to brown in just two generations simply because we have lost most of our individuals in the population and the ones that happened to survive happened to have a higher percentage of the recessive alleles than did the previous generation. And this is a diagram that demonstrates what I'm talking about. So in a large population, the frequency of alleles tend to remain relatively constant. Okay? So in a population of about 20,000, over time, over six generations, we have a slight increase, a slight decrease, etc., but we're not going to have a, a large change in just a quick heartbeat. However, if we have a small um, population size, a population of eight, depending on which two are chosen to breed and which ones don't make it, right, the loss of one individual can very quickly lead to um, the entire population of either this one or that one, depending on how you decide to roll the dice from one generation to the next, one allele can become extinct in just a few generations. So small populations are much more susceptible to genetic drift than our large populations. One of the causes of genetic drift is something called a population bottleneck. So we have two um, very similar events. A population bottleneck and a founder effect are very similar, um, and there are two causes of genetic drift. Basically what happens in a population bottleneck is that something happens to the population where it is drastically reduced to a very small number, natural catastrophe, overhunting, etc., where only a very small subset of the population is available to contribute genes to the next generation. And that means that um, we can have a rapid change in allelic frequencies from one generation to the next, which can reduce the genetic variation very drastically. A good example of this that's been documented recently is the northern elephant seal. In the 1800s, they were uh, highly prized and they were hunted almost to extinction. And they were reduced down to approximately 20 individuals. Now there was a ban on hunting that allowed the population to increase from those original 20 to approximately 30,000. However, 
almost all of them are genetically identical because they came from the same ancestral lineage. And so even though they have a very high number, they now have a population that's a reasonable number, they have no genetic variation in their population. They're very heterogeneous. And um, that leaves them with very little flexibility should some sort of selective pressure arise in their environment. So if their environmental circumstances change, they have very little capacity to evolve because remember, evolution happens on a population. And one of the things that evolution really needs in order for it to occur, in order for us, one of the individuals in the population to rise to the selective pressure challenge is that you have to have variation within the population. And without that, all of the individuals will suffer the same fate. All right, so this is what a, bop, um, a population bottleneck looks like. So if this was the original genetic pool, so the gene pool had a bunch of different colors in it. That means we have tons of different alleles, right? I don't know what we're depicting here, five, right? Then when you shake it, and only a couple come out of that bottleneck, and all of the ones that come out of the bottleneck are blue and yellow, we've eliminated the red allele, the green allele entirely, right? Um, and so that means we've eliminated, we had four, I apologize, not five. So we have four different alleles. We have the red, the green, the blue, and the yellow. When we shake it, only the blue and the yellow come out, and that's just by random chance. But since the red and the green don't make it from one generation to the next picture, everything else left in the bottle is killed in the wildfire, then the population that's left to regenerate is all going to be purple and yellow. And so after the population returns to its original size, Apologize, I said purple, but I meant blue and yellow. Um, the blue and yellow alleles predominate, and the red and green alleles have disappeared entirely. And that's essentially what happened to the elephant seal. And now if we talk about the founder effect, picture that a small subset of the population leaves a large population. Like these guys get on a ship instead of having a wildfire eliminate all those, right? And they get on a ship and they go to a new location, and then all of their descendants come from the genetics that came over on that boat. Right, and so that's called a founder effect. When a small number of individuals leave a large population and establish a new population that's isolated from the original population and is founded entirely on the alleles that were provided by that one set of founders. And if by chance the allele frequencies of those founders differed from the original population, then over time, population B, or the new population, might exhibit allelic frequencies that differ sometimes quite drastically from the original population. And a good example of that is something called the Ellis Van Creveld syndrome, which is basically polydactyly. That means that you have extra fingers or extra digits or extra toes can also be an example. Um, and when a small population created a new population, one of the individuals in that population had polydactyly. And therefore, all of the descendants from that population have a higher percentage chance, a much higher percentage chance than the general population of coming, or being born with polydactyly or an extra finger. All right, let's talk about mating. So mating is almost never random, right? And remember that random mating was one of our Hardy, Weinbo Heidi, Hardy Weinberg principles. And if we have non-random mating or selective mating, then we can end up with um, sexual reproduction that is going to influence the allelic frequencies of the next generation. Sometimes species don't move around. So some species lack mobility and stay right where they're born. And sometimes the offspring could be living right in the same area um, and could actually even be related. And that can lead to inbreeding or breeding of individuals that have the same genetic background. And when relatives are genetically similar, inbreeding increases the number of individuals that or the percentage of the chance of the number of individuals that inherit the same allele from both parents. And that's generally going to result in an increase in the homozygosity of the individual or an increase in the amount of genes in the individual that are homozygous. And an increase in homozygosity can harm harmful effects if we have recessive disorders that can pop up because an individual can now end up being homozygous recessive, meaning that they can display a recessive phenotype for a disorder, which means we can end up with an increased occurrence of different genetic diseases or disorders that are classified as dominant recessive. Um, but let's go back to um, random and non-random mating. So if individuals have preferences that are going to influence their mate choice, then we can end up with changes in um, the percentage of alleles in populations, and we can also end up with what's called assortive mating. So a good example of assortive mating is a snow goose. Snow goose has two color phases. Some of them are white, some are blue-gray. And mate choice is based on colors. Basically, they assort with the same colors. That means that the white goose like to mate with the white goose, and the gray goose might like to mate with the gray goose. And that's called assortive mating. That means that you basically have a preference for mates that are similar 
to yourself. Um, and while neither inbreeding nor sort of mating can change of allelic frequencies in a population, however, non-random mating or selective pressure, like mate choice and mate selection, can change the distribution of genotypes and therefore phenotypes in a population. If, for example, all of the females have mate choice for a particular trait, that means that that trait will be increased in the next population. Um, this is just an example of a non-random assortive mating among snow geese. Again, the white tends to mate with the white, and the gray tend to mate with the gray. Um, and another one of the Hardy-Weinberg principles is that um, all population, all of the genotypes in the population are going to be equally beneficial. That is, there is no selective pressure, no alternative selective pressure. And um, that means that all of the individuals of all of the genotypes would survive and reproduce with equal reproductive success meaning no genotype has any particular advantage over any of the others in an equilibrium population. However, that's not generally going to be the case, right? Oftentimes, individuals who carry a specific allele are going to be favored by natural selection. And natural selection is basically just selective pressure from the environment, whereby individuals that have traits that allow them to survive and reproduce end up with a higher reproductive success than individuals without those traits. And so we've heard the expression survival of the fittest, but really I want you to understand that the expression that we're looking for here is actually reproduction of the fittest, because survival isn't just enough. Um, but natural selection basically is going to favor any trait that increases the ability of the individual or the possessor to increase their reproductive success. So a trait that improves survival then therefore increases the individual's likelihood to reach reproductive age would therefore be something that increases their reproductive success. So any trait that improves the survival can increase the organism's lifespan. An increase in the organism's lifespan obviously increases the ability of opportunities the individual has to reproduce and therefore can improduce, increase the ability's reproductive capacity of the individual. All right. Um, and therefore, individuals that have those alleles that give them a higher reproductive success leave more offspring in the next generation, right? and therefore they inherit a higher percentage of those alleles than other individuals with different alleles, leading to an increase in the allelic frequency of that allele in the next generation. And again, this is considered to be greater fitness, but what we mean by fitness is reproductive success, right? Specifically the ability to survive and reproduce more offspring. Now again, natural selection doesn't act on an, well, it does act on an individual, but really we're looking as a whole on the population. And it doesn't act on the genotypes, right? It acts on the phenotypes, the behaviors and the structures that are displayed based on the genetic makeup in the individual. And so the selection of phenotypes are tied directly to the genotypes, so that's going to inevitably affect the genotypes present in a population. For example, um, a pea, plant's, pea plant's height is influenced directly by the plant's alleles of certain genes. And if you were to specifically pick only those tallest plants to reproduce, then over several generations you would get taller and taller plants and you would end up with a difference in the allelic frequency because you would have the specific alleles that are linked to height increased over time. This here is an example of sexual selection and this is a competition. Basically what's happening here is the males are fighting for the choice of the female mate. And these are the rams are battering into each other, and that means that over time, the stronger males get the opportunity to mate with the females. Because if you consider that these two might bash to the point where one of them ends up injured or possibly dead, and the other one gets the opportunity to mate, that means the one that has the strongest horns is going to pass on the genes. That means the next generation, we're going to get larger and stronger horns. So over time, sexual selection whether it's through ritual combat or mate choice, etc., is going to favor the evolution of particular structures because those are going to be the genes that are going to create the phenotype that is going to be selected for or selected against. So again, these are the five major causes of evolution and these are the inverse of the five major Hardy-Weinberg requirements for a population to maintain an equilibrium. Again, the, they are the exact opposite sides of the coin. So the causes of evolution are mutation, which again, that creates new alleles, which changes the variability instantaneously. Gene flow, when we are bringing genes into or out of a population to increase the similarity of populations that were previously separated. 
genetic drift, which basically is a random change of allelic frequencies. And again, it's more subjective, um, something that small populations are more easily subjected to than large populations. Non-random mating, which is mate choice or mate selection or those mating rituals that we just talked about, all of this can change the genotypic frequencies, perhaps not the allelic frequencies, but sometimes the allelic frequencies. And then also natural and sexual selection, which generally is going to increase the frequency of favored alleles and produce adaptations or changes within the population over time, like larger and larger horns on the rams, for example. Now, all of this also comes down to the fact that we have competition. Some phenotypes are going to reproduce more successfully than others, right? Um, and the phenotypes that are more successful or have the better adaptations to their particular environment are going to be the ones that pass their genes on at higher prevalence into the next generation. And adaptations are just defined as any characteristic that helps an individual survive and reproduce. Just to be clear, an adaptation is specific for a particular environment. So what works really well in one environment, environment might not work well in another. So an adaptation has to not only benefit the individual, but it benefit the individual in the environment in which that individual lives, allowing it to increase its chances of survival and, of course, most importantly, reproduction. Um, other things that we have to take into consideration include the non-living parts of our environment. So all of our environment has selective pressure that's exerted upon the individuals that live within it. The living components, like predator-prey relationships, competition for resources, etc. And then also the non-living components, including the availability of water or minerals or the temperature. Um, so there's a lot of abiotic environmental factors that are involved in selective pressure as well. Um, but for the biotic factors or the factors that have to do with living um, environmental components, such as other organisms, one of the major um, agents of selection is competition. Um, and a competition is any interaction among organisms where they're competing for resources that are more scarce than they need for survival and reproduction. Um, and competition generally tends to be most intense among members of the same species or of similar species because they have the same requirements for survival and reproduction. That means they are going to need to compete for the same resources. In fact, no two competing organisms have such similar requirements for survival as members of the exact same species. Um, and some of the mechanisms of biotic selection include predator-prey relationships. So if two species interact extensively, they're exerting selective pressure on one another. So the, con the concentration or the availability of prey directly relates to the population of the predators, for example. Um, and sometimes that can lead to what we call co-evolution, which is a really neat way whereby two populations, predator and prey, evolve a new feature or modify or force an old one to get a new adaptation in response back and forth. So this is basically a way by which, um, for example, the prey gets faster and therefore the predator has to get faster in order to catch the prey. Um, and over and over co-evolving co to make the fastest predators and the fastest prey. Right? Um, and predation and predator relationships are basically when and one organism, the predator, kills and eats any other organism. That's known as the prey. Then a co-evolution between predators and prey has been going on for millennia, and it's akin to like a biological arms race. Basically, the predation by the wolves selects against the slow deer, so the deer get faster. And alert swift deer select against the slow and the elderly wolves, so the wolves get faster as well. And so over time, both the wolves and the deer end up getting faster and faster. Um, another example of natural selection is antibiotic resistance. So as we all know, if you don't take, continue to take the entire course of your antibiotics, then somehow in your body you have some bacteria that um, have a resistance to whatever it is that you've just taken and then those bacteria are allowed to reproduce in that individual who didn't finish the course of their antibiotics and then over time that individual can now spread the bacteria which have antibiotic resistance around and in just a few generations almost all bacteria for example at this point are resistant to penicillin. Um, now again, just to be clear, natural selection cannot cause a genetic change in an individual. Nothing can cause a genetic change in an individual. You are born with your genes. Again, natural selection does act on the individual, but we are looking at it on a population level. We're looking at the allelic frequency changing in a population from one generation to the next. And last but not least, I want to hammer home the fact that this evolution is not necessarily for the better or for the worse. It's not like a progressive. It is simply the best fit for the environment. So an adaptation that fits in environment A might not be the best adaptation for environment B.
Another type of selection that can occur from the biota is sexual selection, as we talked about. And sexual selection is basically mate choice. So anytime that we have a trait that allows an organism to acquire a mate or have an out competition of its other males or females in the population, that's going to allow for an increase in that trait in the next population. Some of these include male phenotype, male-male competition, kind of like what we talked about with the rams previously. And when males compete for access to females, that can favor the evolution of particular aggressive features that can provide an advantage for those individuals in ritual displays or fights, etc. And again, sexual selection can be driven by either thing. It can be driven by female preference for a particular mate choice or by sexual contests among males. And that can include something like two male birds that are each going to dance in front of a female suitor. Right? And female mate choice actually provides a, a secondary source of sexual selection. So even though those males might fight it out and one of them might end up injured or dead, the female still has the right to walk away from the winner. So female mate choice kind of solidifies that secondary source of sexual selection. And one of the reasons why males might have all of these select, uh, sexual selective features, such as bright colorations um, and ex just structures that they might not need might signify that that individual has enough energy to create these extra structures that might mean that he's going to have a, a be a virile male. It's an outward sign of a male's genetic conditions. So a female that's choosing the brightest or ornamented male is also choosing the healthiest, most vigorous specimen because if he has the cellular energy to waste on all of these extra adornments, then is for certain his body is in tip-top condition. And here's an example of the peacock, right? There's a showy tail, and that's an evolution through sexual selective pressures. Now, we have three major ways in which populations can change. We can have directional selection which favors individual with extreme value of a trait and selects against um, both average individuals and individuals at opposite extremes. What that means is that if we're only selecting for taller individuals, then over multiple generations, you'd expect the entire population to get taller. It means directionally, we're either getting taller, we're getting shorter, we're getting smarter, or something like that. Um, stabilizing selection is when we are favoring individuals with an average value and selecting against both extremes. So we're favoring a medium phenotype and ex excluding the large and the small. And disruptive selection is going to favor individuals at both extremes, but select against the individuals in the middle. So what do I mean by that? So here's the multiple different types of selection. Here's directional selection, stabilizing selection, and disruptive selection. And again, in directional selection, we are favoring one thing over another. In this case, we're favoring larger than average sizes. So we're favoring everything that is 40% and above and everything that's 30% or low is not getting the chance to mate and reproduce, which means that over time, the individuals that are getting to mate and reproduce are going to be getting larger and larger and larger. So our average phenotype is going to shift in one direction or another, in this case towards a larger size, but it could be towards taller or higher IQ, et cetera, over time. Stabilizing selection is when our extremes are not favored. So anyone that is too tall or too small too short has a hard time finding a mate, whereas someone of average height is going to be able to find a mate with no problem, meaning that over time average sizes being favored means that we end up with more and more individuals at that average level and very, very few on the outskirts. That means that we're going to end up with a, a heterogeneous population, so phenotypic variability tends to decline in this, um, in this situation. Now, disruptive selection is when we have favoritism towards the larger and the smaller, but not the medium size. A good example of this would be beak sizes in finches. So, for example, if the small beaks are able to pick up small seeds off the ground, and the large beaks are able to crack the strong large seeds, then the individuals with the small beaks have a food source, a different food source, and then the large individuals with the large beaks also have a food source, but the ones in the middle with the medium-sized beak are unable to pick up the small seeds or crack the large seeds, and so they end up without a food source. And so over time, we end up with two separate populations with different phenotypes, right? Those with the small beak and those with the large beak, for example. So disruptive selection is when we are favoring the extremes and not favoring the intermediate phenotype. Um, again, an example of directional selection is when we are selecting for a specific character trait 
based on a specific change in environmental conditions. So for example, if the environment changes such that the climate becomes colder, mammal species that had thicker and thicker fur would evolve over time. It's very likely to anticipate that because those that had the thicker fur would be better able to survive and reproduce in the colder climates. Stabilizing selection occurs when the two extremes are going to be selected against and the medium phenotype is preferred. Um, for example, intermediate body sizes of the Aristolinger lizards are preferred over the extremes because the smaller ones have a hard time defending their territory and the larger ones are too large and they're going to be likely to be eaten by owls because they're able to be seen. So the medium sized ones are able to both defend their territory and avoid being eaten by owls, so avoiding predation. And then finally, disruptive selection, which is when um, individuals with a population that are going to have different habitats might have two different food sources, for example. And that would mean that the population could end up dividing into two different phenotypic groups, one that's able to get the small seeds and one that's able to crack the larger hard seeds. And the intermediate phenotype that's unable to pick up the small seeds and unable to crack the large seeds are going to have a hard time with the food source. So that's going to lead to two separate sets of populations. Um, and so this is an example of what we call a balanced polymorphism. And what that means is that we have two phenotypes in a population that are both maintained because we have two different food sources or two different parts of the habitat that they're going to occupy. And each phenotype would be favored by a particular environmental factor. And one of the last examples that I'm going to leave you with are a version of hemoglobin that's present in a particular human populations in Africa. You may have heard of this as sickle cell anemia. I apologize, this should have been the slide before. Here's the black-bellied seed crackers that have two different phenotypes. Here's the large beak that's able to crack the large seeds. Here's the small beak that's able to pick up the small seeds. And the intermediate phenotype is unable to do either. So that's going to be the balanced polymorphism that we talked about. But let's get back to, um, to sickle cell anemia. So we have two different sets of hemoglobin alleles, the normal allele and the sickle cell allele in the regions of Africa that are prone to malaria. Now individuals that are homozygous for the sickle cell allele, generally suffer from severe anemia and um, without treatment end up dying, uh, particularly in populations where there's no hospital, right? Um, however, the sickling of the red blood cells that's seen in the homozygous population is reduced a little bit in the heterozygous and they also have an increased resistance to malaria. And so what that means is that the heterozygote has a phenotype whereby they're able to get enough oxygen to circulate their body, but they also have a resistance to malaria, meaning that individuals that have the sickle cell are going to have a, um, a better chance of surviving in regions where malaria is present. So again, the heterozygote is going to have an increased resistance to malaria because they have one allele for normal hemoglobin that allows them to have moderate anemia but able to still get oxygen to their cells. And they have a selective advantage over either homozygote because they're also resistant to malaria. Well, thank you very much for sticking with me today. I appreciate your time and attention. Aloha and happy studying. We'll see you next time.